dawn of electricity. If we're going back tens of thousands of years, nighttime is when things got interesting, you know? It's when the Bacchanalian festivals would happen. It's when, you know, the men and women would run out into the woods and drink wine and have sex and make babies. And that, to a large extent, informs what we're doing now. The freaks come out at night, man. I don't know what to tell you, you know what I mean? Uh, that's always when people want to party is at nighttime. The lights go out, people want to dance. I just think that, you know, things go down in the night, you know? People want to get a little more freaky in the night. Some people say nothing good happens after 2 a.m., but nothing creative happens before 2 a.m. <laughs> the darkness, being under cover of the dark, people being able to cut loose to feel less self-conscious, less self-aware, less, you know, involved in our own little personal neuroses. Music in the dark brings people to that spirit world where anything can happen. And I, I think the closest I've ever felt to God was on a dance floor. And I think a lot of people feel the same. The funny thing is, if we were doing this interview 10,000 years ago, we could be talking about how at night we bang on drums and dance around lights and a fire. Fast forward 10,000 years, people are still dancing with lights in their eyes to rhythmic music. So it's almost encoded in our DNA. EDM didn't just appear out of nowhere. You know, it, it has its story and its lineage. And that's important to recognize. And um, part of it is, is understanding and appreciating that events like EDC and Nocturnal Wonderland have been around for two decades. My first memory of Nocturnal was 97. Pasquale brought us out for Nocturnal and he lost his venue two days before. A lot of parties back then got shut down before they even happened. And Pasquale found an Indian reservation and paid the tribe to be able to throw this party. The Indians had had a quarrel because the ones that agreed to throw the party and took the money were not sharing it with the other Indians that also own the property. Two days later, 20,000 people show up to an unannounced venue. They had closed off the fences with the locks and the chains and um, had guns. These Indians are shooting guns off. Pasquale tried to talk to them and they wouldn't have it. And so he ended up slamming on the gate and telling us to bust the gate open with the car. 20,000 ravers cut through uh, barbed wire fences, pull in and run into the party. And that was kind of an uh, interesting first memory of a nocturnal wonderland. Some people are set in their ways and they think that like this like style of dance music is better than this. Like, and if you listen to this style of dance music, you're stupid or you're like lame or you're like in the past and it's like, but they have no like true appreciation for like the history and like the buildup and what it took to get from that, the beginnings of that genre to the main stage. I think that people could do a little more research and you know, go deeper than like what ha came out last year. They could go 10 years deeper, they can go 20 years deeper or 30 years deeper for that matter. The funny thing with dance music, especially electronic dance music, there's one person who invented it which is um, a friend of mine, he started a band called Silver Apples in the late 60s. Um, his name's Simon, or Simon. And he, if you go back and listen to this record that he made in 1968, he invented dance music. There's one song called Oscillations. It's got a 4-4 kick and synths that he built himself, and it's, it's house music. So it's really interesting that you can say that was when it started. <laughs> of the word house music, I'm amazed that no one knows what that meant. Because house music, Frankie Knuckles in the mid 80s left New York and went to Chicago and DJed at a club called The Warehouse. And he started playing 4-4 dance music and people started saying, oh, that's the music that Frankie plays at The Warehouse and they just started calling it house music. Who you are and what you played uh, 
was more important than like what was popular sort of like in the mainstream at the time. I was allowed to play tracks that maybe weren't as obvious sounding and had more repetition in them. Music that could evolve and change over time. And because your audience was dedicated to the music, they weren't going anywhere else. They were there for the duration. Hardcore was in. It was like Demi God and Ron Decor and Omar Santana and Rob G and these kind of guys. I remember just like being like in high school, like, holy shit, what is this music? The first time I heard Ron Decor, like, I don't even know what it was. It was like machines. What I remember the most is just people getting ballistic and getting crazy and moshing the speakers, seeing speaker stacks, you know, pretty much in the verge of falling down and actually falling down. I think I remember one of the years I actually had uh, a speaker fall on me <laughs> when I was playing. As a kid, when you like first hear that, like, and you're just like, man, this is nuts. This is a rave. Like, like this is like not the shit they play on the radio at all. <laughs> The buzzword for today is um, transformative festivals, and it comes from an evolution of what we were doing at Nocturnal. Nocturnal was a party by the people, for the people, and with the people, bringing whatever they could to make it happen. And that unity, that change, was transformative. That was our religion. That was people coming together and having a good time was all we needed. Because this, this is the thing, the old scene in dance music was very much about psychedelia, spirituality, you know what I mean, plur came out of that. Now I think music, you know, EDM music is about energy, and I describe it the way that I would describe what punk rock was at the time, you know, there was all this like folk music and very melodic music in the 70s, and then punk rock came along and it was just about energy, it was just about creating this vibration. Where our music was introverted, today's music is more extroverted. When I first started DJing, I remember the huge satisfaction I felt when I beat matched two records. And I think it was like a New Order record and a Ministry record. And I felt so proud of myself. I was like, I just mixed and it, like the people kept dancing. Like, you know, you really had to have your flow. There was no such thing as having like USB or premix. It was live and it was right there. You know, carrying flight cases of vinyl through airports, no one liked that. You know, or the terror. Like I remember one time DJing in Belgium and I was standing by the baggage claim waiting for my records to come off and they didn't. And I realized if you're a guitar player and your guitar doesn't come through baggage claim, you rent a new guitar. If you're a DJ and your records don't come off the baggage, don't show up at baggage claim, you simply can't play. So for me, that's why I love USB sticks. Because if you lose them, you have them backed up and they weigh less than a French fry. I love the feel of vinyl, I love the smell of vinyl. I love the fact that it's tangible. It's something you can listen to, you can put it away, you can look at it. It's, it's just, it's personal. experience is totally different. The only thing we had was going to record stores. 
and the art of getting the best record, the art of knowing what record was coming out before anyone else knew about it, the art of going to six or seven different record stores every week to getting the right cut, knowing your distributors, knowing your record buyers for each record store, that was an art. If you weren't in the store when those 12 copies came in, you just would never see that record again. You know, so there's something about being in those spaces across the week, you know, and just hanging out and getting to know the guys in the record store and them knowing what you liked, them holding stuff when it did come in. So if you weren't in there on that day, that record come in, they're going to slip one down the back for you and be able to bring that out later on. There was a store on Melrose called Beat Nonstop, and that was like a huge service for like drum and bass, house, hardcore, and like that was like really like the cultural epicenter. Because you didn't have the internet and you didn't have online shopping. And so everybody had to socialize. People bought their tickets there. People like bought the records there. People bought the mixtapes there. People bought the clothes that they were gonna wear to go to the party at the record store because you couldn't go to Macy's and go buy some kickwear. I had the money to go to a record store. I would, I, I would. I'm trying to think of what changed other than like the size of pants. When I started going to parties in the early 90s, everyone was wearing the biggest jeans possible, Jenko jeans. They were like size 60 waist, they were all bunched up, you'd get a belt like around three times and kind of like super flary, all denim. They would have extra pieces of denim, like people would take the seams open and like put another piece of denim in there to make them like super big. Bucket hats. Kickwear, UFOs. I remember kids with Mickey Mouse gloves and freaking these belts that like, uh, they were seat belts, seat belt belts. Oh man, everyone was so creative. Everyone was making their own clothes. And I think that that's one of the cool things about the culture now is everyone's still doing that. You know, it's like people are still making their own clothes and getting creative and they're going out in like themes. It's also cool because people can interact on Instagram and say where this outfit's from or this person and then when they go to the party they know that that person is a creator. There's like certain people who have huge followings and the costumes are so incredible and they just lend to the whole energy and the spirit of it. It's funny like comparing the crowds from you know 2000 earlier to now 2015 there's, there's not much difference in like the energy and the excitement like the most difference I feel is like the fashion absolutely the fashion's different but I mean they're all coming I feel for the same reason of just you know escaping and listening to some amazing music so you always see the same energy and the same it's great the biggest change in dance music um, has simply been how it's been made you know, to make a dance record in the 80s or the early 90s, you needed a room full of weird equipment. You know, you needed your mixing desk, you needed samplers, you needed synths, you needed boxes that converted din sync into MIDI and MIDI into din sync. Like making dance music in 1990 was really complicated. And as a result, only a few people could do it. And now, because of the software, anyone can make a dance record. You know, it's almost easier to like, make a dance record on Ableton than it is to pay your taxes. So as a result, it's become incredibly democratic and egalitarian, you know? And I, I actually think it's a really good thing that making dance music has become so easy because now everyone does it. And so it's almost like you now have millions of people with laptops who are stakeholders in the world of dance music. People don't understand that indirectly dance music is the one thing that's really just opening people's minds whether they like it or not. And I think that's honestly the magic of places like Nocturnal and the magic of dance music itself. The biggest difference, I think, from back then until now is the way people dance and where they dance. Nobody used to look at the DJ so much, but there was walls of speakers and everybody faced the speakers and everyone would try to get to the front of the speaker just like they try to get to the front of the stage now. Everyone was there facing the speakers, like banging on the speakers, just like all night, like worshiping the speakers, just bass. And they used to have these subwoofers called Tonka, and you could actually like climb up inside them and people would be 
in there dozens of people inside of these speakers like all on top of each other just like <laughs> just that sound it's just all you hear but it was like i mean that that feeling of the bass just like washing over your body you know it was this awesome and i remember you know early 2000s or a little later almost feeling awkward when people started turning and facing me because i was just like don't look at me i'm not doing anything you know i'm just like mixing you know but before it was more like i would spin and i would look to the speaker stacks and see if the speaker stacks were jumping or not my first nocturnal was the year a year that rabbit in the moon played we would kind of have an interaction with the crowd the way a band would so we would have, you know, fire dancers, live video kind of before anybody else was doing video projections that were stage oriented. You know, we were kind of the Grateful Dead of, of electronic music at that time. And we just had very obsessive fans that were getting tattoos and following us around the U.S. everywhere we played. My best guy friend who has a tattoo of Rabbit Moon on his back shoulder, and he was in the front row because he was such a fan. And then he got pulled on stage. Pulled someone out from the crowd and he, he made this person get on their knees. He pulled out a mask and he put it in front of this person's face. And then he pulled a saw out and proceeded to create a stream shower of sparks, probably about 10 feet high in the air, and just blast this person's face. And I remember him pulling it off kind of I'm done now. It was all over. Like, he, I don't know if his brain kind of exploded or what happened, but I remember looking at that going, this is some next level shit. <laughs> it was performance art. Uh, we did everything we could to evoke emotion in an audience, to make people realize that this is actually happening right now, to reach out and touch them physically and make them snap out of that bubble of, oh, this is all make-believe, this isn't, this is real. We're here in this moment together and we're gonna create something special out of that. And I think Pasquale really connected with that and tried to uh, include that in all his events. The performer aspect of Insomniac is what makes Insomniac stand out amongst anybody else that throws parties anywhere in the world. So these were events where Pasquale was throwing this event himself. He was flying for this event himself. And we would all gather at these events that, for the most part, were being put on by those of us that lived here in the city. Pasquale, you know, my earliest memories of Pasquale was I would come out of a party at like four or five in the morning. And he was handing out flyers. And I was like, and he was so friendly and so cute and so fun. And I'm like, why don't you come in with us? And he looked very regal at the time. You know, even though he was passing out flyers, he'd have like the, the rave robes and everything. And I said, come in with us. And he was like super charming. He's like, you know what? I can't, I've got to work. This is like what I do. I'm doing it. Come to my party. <laughs> you want to come to my parties? And we, we would. Back then, it was pioneering days. It was the beginning of everything. So stack of speakers, one strobe light and a black light, and that was the rave. I think if you would compare, if you would look at an early nocturnal and a, and a modern nocturnal, you would say, oh, clearly it's, it's higher production value. But at the time, all of the nocturnals were at the highest production value they could be at. So, I mean, they've been doing, you know, the best shows each and every year. It's just that things have gotten better over the years. DJing in Los Angeles since 91, you know, I'd seen everything from the renegade break-in warehouse parties to the parties downtown LA, rat infested, to, you know, all of a sudden the high production parties. And I think Nocturnal was the first party that I ever saw that I walked in and thought, holy shit, this just went to the next level. And it just, you know, it was the most colorful, psychedelic, like beautiful thing I had ever seen at the time. If you're 18 or 20 or 25 and you walk into this environment with the most remarkable sound, the most remarkable visuals, all these people covered in makeup and dancing crazy, you know, of course it's gonna succeed. You know, how can it not? Like when you create an environment that powerful, of course hundreds of thousands of people are gonna wanna be a part of it. Once again, will the renegade master be for damage of power to the people's back? Once again, will the renegade master be for damage of the ill behaviors back? Once again, will the renegade master be for damage of power to the people's back? Once again, will the renegade master be for damage of the ill behaviors back? Renegade back, back, master. Renegade back, back, master. Renegade back, back, master. Be for damage of the ill behaviors.
I've been going to nocturnals for almost 20 years. And there's, there's always been a presence of jungle, drum and bass. There's always been a presence of hardcore, hard style. There's always been a presence of house and trance. And I think that's like what's really, really awesome because like a lot of pe kids can have the same experience that I had when I was a kid by going to a nocturnal now because you're going to hear like an evolved version of the same music that's been playing for since 97, 98. As much as things have changed with the scene, you know, things have gotten so much bigger and production and the spectacle and the numbers of people. But um, a lot of the fundamental principles are the same as, as day one, you know, the sense of unity, uh, the sense of, of change through music and culture, the positivity, everybody sort of contributing something positive to the experience, whether you're the promoter or the DJ or the lighting person or just attending a club goer. I think collectively, uh, the sense that we can change the world and that's uh, stayed true.